water and you feel like you got something to pull against, you actually, um, you know, can learn the stroke better. So that's hence a, a resistor around your board might be better. Um, and that's why land drills are good because it, it magnifies the, uh, the resistance that you feel and you can, you, your muscles learn that feeling better and then you can take that feeling out of the water, okay? So it, 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 it's a way to get load uh, for this drill and you can't really do it with a paddle. So um, I, got, I, I came up with this drill based on something that Jimmy Terrell uh, showed me in a clinic that we did together. Um, one of the cool things about doing clinics with other people is you learn their uh, methods for teaching and their analogies and their ways of explaining things and you take some of that and you make it your own. Um, so I got this from Jimmy. So big shout out to Jimmy Terrell, the mad scientist from QB. And um, in this drill he was talking about, uh, he was showing people how to get rotation. And so what he did, I'll go on this side first. What he did is he got one person to stand where I am and another person standing facing them and they were just, you know, a handshake width apart. So he said, okay, reach out, shake hands. So the two of them shook hands and then he told each of them to take a step back. So they each took a step back, but they kept holding hands. And right away you can see that the only way to, to continue to hold hands when you've taken a step back is to get some shoulder rotation. So that was what he said to get some shoulder rotation. You know, then he said, put your hand up overhead like you would have your, your top hand on a paddle, and boom, there you've got your shoulder rotation. I'll do that from the other side. So it was simply, you face your partner, you reach out and you shake hands, and then you each take a step back, and now in order to maintain your handshake position, you've got shoulder rotation, right? And you can see the shoulder rotation I have here. You can see, you know, some of my back, right? So what I thought about is that was really cool drill for teaching rotation. But then what I thought, well, what if we used it to teach unrotation or what to do once you've got the rotation, what you do, like whenever we get rotation, that doesn't, that puts us in position to pull, but it doesn't help us pull, right? It's the, it's the unrotation that allows us to pull. So I thought, well, what if we got into that rotated position and then we practiced unrotating and we kept holding on to our partner's hand because that partner if they didn't resist, if it didn't become a tug of war, if they just kind of held on and just let themselves be kind of loose dead weight uh, and didn't, you know, dig in and be make like a tug of war, um, they would provide a, an amount of resistance that's kind of similar to the resistance that you feel on your paddle blade when you pull. And so what I've been doing is getting people in camps and clinics when we do this drill to um, face each other and to get into that rotated position, right? And then I ask them to pull their partner. And I tell the partner not to resist. Don't dig in and make it a tug of war. Just let them pull your body weight. And so the person who's pulling can pull and they can figure out whether they want to pull with shooting their hips back like that or whether they want to pull with rotation or whether they want to pull with a bit of both, right? And so they can get a sense of pulling and where the power is coming from against the weight of the individual across from them, okay? Um, and so that's really effective. So what I ask them to do first is to just pull, keeping your hips in one plane, okay? So, I mean, if you just look at my, look at my belt, imagine that that is, you know, the level of my belt and sort of maybe you can look at where my belt is relative to the fence that's behind me, right? Okay, if my hips go down, they go to a different plane. If they stay, kind of in the same plane as I pull, right? They don't go down, that's pulling in the same plane. So I ask them to pull in the same plane and see how much power they can generate. So they get the partner to not resist, but to just be dead weight, and they get the rotation, and then they pull. So they can pull by thrusting their hips back, keeping them in the same plane. They can pull by rotating and keeping your hips in the same plane. They can pull by a combination of the two, and the partner, they get an idea of, of how much force they can generate by sort of how far they pull their partner. And the partner can give some really cool feedback too because the partner is usually standing there like this and then when they get pulled, they, they, go flying, they go flying forward, right? Okay, so I mean, if I was the partner who was being pulled and my partner pulled me, I would get pulled by my partner like that. So that gives them an idea uh, the person pulling um, about how strong 
it, you can generate a pull when you're using your hips and your legs and your core, right, to generate that pull. Um, but it's that's all in one plane. And, and when you're keeping your hips in one plane, when you're keeping them at one level, again, think of my belt and where it sits against the fence behind me. You can use the fence as a reference point. When you're keeping your hips in one plane, it means that your legs aren't bending much. The legs are, your legs are pretty much staying at the bend they have when you got your catch, right? Um, so then what I ask them to do is I ask them to now start to bend your legs as you are at your knees, as you're doing your pull. And I ask them to see, both partners, to see if it feels like they generate any more power, okay? So the person that's pulling obviously will be able to tell whether it's generating more power. And the person who's being pulled is going to know whether it generated more power too because they're already impressed with the amount of pulling that the, the person doing the pulling could do um, and how far they could move that person um, when they just pulled in one plane. But I ask them to see if they, if they feel like they're being pulled even more forcefully um, if the person pulling them actually bends their legs as they pull. And what I do is I try to tell them, I'll just tuck my shirt in right now so you can see my belt. Um, what I ask the, the person who's doing the pulling to do is to get their rotation and when they pull, again, don't just pull in the same plane, but to pull and take their hand, try to get their hand to pull down towards their ankle so that you're pulling back with your hips and you're pulling down, okay? And if you think of some of the paddlers that you've seen, some of the top paddlers in the world when they're paddling, think of how low their paddling side hand gets to the rail of the board. Like I've seen some of these guys, their legs are really bent and when they're pulling they get even bent more and their legs are really down low and their, and their hand, their paddock side hand is really down low close to the rail of the board and if you're standing in a dugout where your feet are that far below the rail, you know, their hands look like they're, they're you know, they're only that high above the rail. I think of Michael Booth when I, I've seen how low his bottom hand gets. Um, I've seen Connor do drills where he gets exceptionally low. Um, it doesn't get that low when he's paddling all the time, but when he's doing drills, he gets really low. Um, <clears throat> and I compare that to a lot of people who are paddling like this, and their hand is, you know, this far from the water, right? And that's a long way from the water. Think of if you were doing work in the backyard and you were holding a shovel, right? Like, you wouldn't want to have that much um, shovel length, you know, beneath your, your bottom hand. You'd have no strength. You get your hand down nice and low and you get close to the to the earth that you're digging. And it's this same kind of thing, you know, you kind of want to get nice and low to the water when you're really pulling. So I ask the two partners, to um, the one per partner to provide dead weight and the other partner this time to not just pull towards their hip but to try to pull down as they're pulling. And it's remarkable the difference in amount of force that you can generate when you don't just pull back in one plane, but when you actually pull down as you're doing it, when you actually sink your legs, bend your legs, sink your butt, and you're pulling forcefully like back with your hips, and I tend to rotate my hips as I do it, and pulling down, the partner goes flying, and they can feel a huge difference between just pulling in one plane and pulling using your legs. Okay, so um, again, you don't have the paddle in your hands during this drill, what you do is you're, you're, you're using your partner as the load, not, you know, not the paddle blade against the ground. You're not trying to get that bent shaft feeling. You're using your partner as the, as the load. Okay? So um, that's basically the drill. And it, it's really important, too, to get to this point. I'm going to get the, my rotation again. To get to this point right? Because this is the point that most people are when they're exiting, or where you want to be when you're exiting, when you're getting ready to exit, okay? Look where my hands were. So this is, would be where my blade was. My blade's just in front of my feet. Move a little bit further back so you can see my feet. My blade is just in front of my feet. My hand is still, like, up by my face. And um, there's a bit of a negative angle to my shaft, but not a lot, right? I haven't collapsed way down like this. My back is still in a, you know, I'm bent over a lot, but most of a lot of it's come from my legs. And now I want to do my exit. I want to start to think about my exit. 
And this is what the next drill is going to be. Going from the point where your body got to in this drill, right, without the paddle in your hands. So I'm going to go from here, I'm going to pick up my paddle. Here's my paddle, now it's in the water. I'm going to picture me in my, on my board. I'm getting ready to exit now, right? Okay, so we're going to look at how to exit from here where you can use your hips and push yourself past the paddle. That's going to be the drill we're going to do next week. Okay, um, and just a couple of things too. I talked in the first uh, land drill that we did about one of the biggest mistakes that people make, right, at the front of the stroke, and that is taking too long to bury the blade. Where the blade goes in the water, the, the tip contacts the water, and then they get all of this blade travel before it finally gets buried, right? All of that blade travel, and they lose all their positive angle while the blade's getting buried. They're getting no body weight on the blade as the blade's getting buried because it's it didn't get buried right away and support their body weight. Um, and so they're, you know, half of their stroke, the most productive half of the stroke of positive blade angle was done with the blade, you know, not buried to finally getting buried at vertical. And they've lost the best part of their stroke, essentially, right? So that's the biggest mistake that people make. The other big mistake that people make, and I'll leave this in your mind for the uh, for the next drill. You can think about it up until the next drill where we look at the exit. The other mistake, big mistake that people make is, is once they get down on their on their paddle, like they once they climb on top of their paddle and they load on top of the paddle. And I like to say that paddling could be divided into two phases only, right? The loading phase where you're you catch and then you load onto the paddle, load your body weight, load your force onto the paddle. And then the unloading phase where you unload and come back into the board and then go in the recovery between strokes. So what happens is the second biggest mistake that people make is they load and then when they finish loading they stay down here and their hands go from here like that and then they stand up. Right? Now think about it. Just look at this and imagine I'm standing on a board on the water. I'm loading. That's all good, right? But I get to here and I'm finished loading. And now just watch my hands. And watch my paddle angle being lost. And nothing else is moving. My legs aren't moving, my hips aren't moving, my upper body's not moving other than a little bit of rotation in order for me to move my arms, right? They go like that and then they stand up. But think about it. The paddle blade from here to there, the only thing moving the paddle through that pretty considerable distance. Like that's at least a foot of a stroke, a foot of the of the stroke. The only thing moving the paddle blade is my hands. And what did we say about big muscles preferentially over small muscles, right? We said you have to try to always be using big muscles preferentially over small muscles. Well, if you're just moving your hands and your arms, those are pretty small muscles that you're using. And this is in a point in the stroke when you have your hips behind you and you have your legs bent they're in position to really do some work here against the paddle, right? Because your legs can stand up. And think about it, that's like doing a squat. If you could do a squat and apply it to the paddle blade, the water loaded in the paddle blade, my goodness, that would be a huge uh, source of power that you could use to propel your board forward. And, um, and then your hips and the muscles across your hips. It, it, again, hips, the most heavily muscle joined the body. If you could apply those muscles to the standing up motion, I, uh, while it was still loading the paddle, that could really help you, right? So you go from making the biggest, the second biggest mistake that people make, which is loading and then pausing before they unload and stand up, right? You go from making that mistake to what I'm going to show you in the next drill, where you load and you immediately start to unload, okay? So um, think about that for the next drill. Think about that loading and immediately starting to unload. If you're paddling, if you're lucky enough to still be paddling right now, you're not locked out, locked down, or, or locked off the water, then um, try, experiment when you're paddling, not only about using your legs more in the pull, like I just showed you today, about getting a little lower and using more legs to get the blade deeper into the water, and to generate more force during the pulling phase, right? But also think about what happens when you get here, about how you would then unload, okay? And give that some thought. Um, and then in the next drill that I show you, 
I'll give you some ideas on uh, what it's supposed to feel like, how you're supposed to do it. And this drill, the one I'm going to show you next week, the, the exit drill, is probably the best drill that, uh, that I have for uh, getting you to actually feel movement because you're actually going to propel yourself uh, past the paddle. So um, that's just something to look forward to. Um, the other thing I'm going to show you next week is a leg circuit that you can do because I know that a lot of people are... Um, they're actually under lockdown right now. You can't get it even out of the house or they can't get to the water. So they're looking for things to do um, that are productive things for training. And, um, uh, you know, land drills are great, but they want to be, they want to do something where they're loading muscles and they're, they're working their cardio and they're just looking for new ideas because I'm sure they're getting stale running out of, uh, you know, running up and down the stairs in their house or their apartment building or, uh, um, you know, whatever. So um, I'm going to show you a leg circuit that you can do, and uh, I'll do that next week as well. So there's a couple of things that I, I've got on top coming up uh, next week, and uh, I know that uh, Seychelles is going to be back with some stuff, Victoria is going to be back with some stuff, and um, we've got a few guest uh, presenters too who are going to do Facebook Live uh, videos for everybody as well. So. Hopefully we can keep you engaged and give you some productive, uh, you know, stuff that's productive, that's helpful, not only now during the pandemic, but moving forward as well. Uh, one last thing, uh, my dogs are watching me through the sliding door. Do you want to meet my dogs? I'll get them out real quick for all the dog lovers out there. Hang on. Come on, let's go. Come on. Come on, Robbie. Finley, come on. Come on, Finley. All right. Okay, come on, come on. Hey, come here, come here, come here. Come here, Robbie. This is Leo. He's eight months. This is Robbie. Robbie's a rescue dog. He doesn't want to, he wants to be shy for the camera. Oh, he ran away. Robbie's uh, about seven years old. He's a rescue dog. He's been amazing. And Finley, come on, buddy. Finley. Finley's the old guy. He's 11. Come on, Finley. He's wondering if it's worth coming down the stairs. I guess he's decided it's not. Okay, so I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to turn the camera. There's Robbie and Finley up at the top of the stairs. Oop, can you see that? Robbie and Finley, there they are. Okay, that's Leo. This is me. And I'm saying thanks for joining me. And uh, I'm just going to say goodbye now. Please, everybody, stay well. Um, I will see you uh, on Facebook Live next week. And in the meantime, please uh, stay healthy, stay safe. And... Uh, I'll talk to you then. See ya.